Tripolitania. At first sight, there are few traces of this ancient and legendary place in northwest Libya. This is also true of Libya's centuries old capital city of Tripoli, once named Oya. The foundation of this city dates back to the 7th century BC. At that time, Tripoli was an important trading center for the Carthaginians. And today, the harbor is important to the local fishermen. For countless generations, all manner of goods have passed through Tripoli's harbor. A large amount of fish is unloaded here and distributed to the region's various markets. In this part of Tripoli's historic city center, age-old traditions are still respected, although modern life has also found its way here. Fishing played an important role for the inhabitants of the Phoenician and later Carthaginian city of Oya, and the waters of the Libyan coast are still rich in fish. Both tuna and sardine have contributed to the establishment of what is a very profitable fishing industry. For many years, Tripoli was the most important fishing harbor in Libya. Although several new harbors have gradually been created in Libya, Tripoli's fishing industry is relatively secure. The 1,600-kilometer Mediterranean coastline of Libya provides many of the country's inhabitants with a good, yet relatively modest, income. A walk through the Medina, Tripoli's atmospheric old town, also indicates that this part of the ancient metropolis has also seen a few changes. Most of the traditional dwellings are no longer inhabited. Only a few areas of the old town have retained their historic authenticity. However, they still possess a mesmerizing sense of the exotic. As much as anything else, it's the local plants, majestic palm trees and impressive cacti that give Tripoli its Mediterranean atmosphere. Clearly, the influence of the sea is only present close to the coast. A few kilometers inland is endless desert. The Sahara not only shapes the landscape, but also Libya's climate. In most of Libya, there is little rainfall. It's therefore not surprising that in antiquity, the larger settlements originated in the north of Libya, close to the fertile coastal regions. In recent times, the historic districts of Tripoli's Medina have sprung back into life. Several of the centuries-old houses have been renovated and re-inhabited. Life has returned to the lanes of the city's old town. The historic buildings not only serve as living quarters, but also as shops.
The limitation of trade to state monopoly has for many years constrained and severely impacted upon business in the local markets. However, the increasing liberation of the country has also helped Tripoli and its historic buildings to enjoy a new lease of life. The traditional architecture combines well with the striking technical achievements of modern times. Old and new in perfect harmony. A splendid sight. In many parts of the Medina, the influence of the Orient is omnipresent. In the middle of the 7th century, what is now Libya was conquered by the Arabs. In subsequent times, a new religion was introduced to the former region of Tripolitania. Because the country's new rulers followed Islam, Tripoli became part of the Ibadid state. Many souks originated during this epoch. Souks being the commercial districts of Arab towns. The many one-story high buildings once formed the economic center of both commerce and handicrafts. Traditionally, both the workshops and selling areas of the souks are in the same place. This gives added charm to these fascinating areas. Here, one can gain a good insight into the skill of the local blacksmiths who continue to work along traditional lines. The sound of tin being hammered often fills Tripoli's souks. Just beyond a clock tower that was built in 1860 by the Ottomans is where the boiler makers are to be found. Manually, they create various objects of all shapes and sizes out of sheet copper. The magnificent platters are the most popular. These ornaments are typical of those countries influenced by Islam, such as Libya. The difficult work of the boilermakers becomes apparent while strolling through Tripoli's old town. The city's boilermakers have a history that dates back hundreds of years. And there are many more interesting workshops and shops to discover within the picturesque souks of the Medina. Close to the boilermakers is the Turkish market, the Sukaturk. It's dominated by the sale of cloth. In contrast to other North African metropolis, such as Tunis or Algiers, Tripoli's souks are relatively calm. This means that tourists are able to stroll through the lanes without constantly being harassed by the local tradesmen and can thus enjoy shopping without undue pressure. Since the foundation of the ancient Tripolitanian city of Oya, trade has always been important here. The stalls of the fruit and vegetable sellers in the souks of the old Medina are an array of bright and tempting colors, a typical sight. This is where the local inhabitants come to buy most of their daily needs.
However, the old town doesn't only feature historic markets. The more recently built souks mainly sell modern products such as electric tools as well as fashionable jewellery and textiles. Although most of the goods for sale here are imported, it doesn't detract from the special atmosphere of the souks. In contrast, the historic part of Tripoli still has a magical atmosphere, like something from the 1001 Nights. There's a particularly enthusiastic ambience in the women's markets. As the name suggests, they specialize in various products for women. Close to the fishing harbor, the Marcus Aurelius Arch is a reminder of Roman times that also left its traces in various parts of the city. The former Oia, one of the three big cities of Tripolitania, fell in 46 BC to Julius Caesar and his Roman Empire. The city became part of the new Roman province of Africa Nova. The triumphal Marcus Aurelius Arch was erected much later. Before the city fell to the Roman Empire, it had enjoyed great economic freedom. Although since the middle of the second century, Oia had been ruled by the Numidians. With Roman rule, Tripolitania enjoyed a long period of peace, an epoch that brought Oia much economic success. The wealth of the inhabitants of that time is demonstrated by the remains of the triumphal Marcus Aurelius Arch that was built in 163 AD. In many parts of Tripoli, there are also the remains of Ottoman rule. The Karaman Lee building contains a fine museum. In the center of the old town, during the second half of the 18th century, one of the city's most splendid residences was built. Indeed, it took 40 years to complete. Yusuf Pasha Karamanli, the most powerful and famous member of his dynasty, used this splendid building until 1832 as his personal residence and also for his many wives. That is why this important building was built only from the finest materials to create a harem, the Hush Al Harim. As part of the Ottoman Empire, Tripoli soon became the capital of the province. But the city retained its autonomy. On the upper floor of the Karamanli, there's a special exhibition that provides a splendid insight into the former life of the Pasha. Many stories are told of the luxurious lifestyle of the monarch. After the Karamanli dynasty came to an end, the building was temporarily used as the seat of the Tuscan consulate. The decadent rule of the Karamanlis was also based upon the pillaging of the Corsairs that spread fear and despair all along the North African coastline.
From the 16th to the 19th centuries, Algiers, Tunis and Tripoli were the three main Mediterranean metropolis of the Corsairs. An eye-catching landmark that dates back to the time of the Corsairs is the citadel in Tripoli's harbour. The Arabs enlarged the original Byzantine complex to a fortress. Then, for a short spell, the city fell into the hands of the Spanish conquerors. Twenty years after the conquest of the fortress, in 1531, the Spaniards were driven out by the Corsairs. The citadel became the main headquarters of the Corsairs, who were allies of the Turkish Sultan, who supported them. Since the end of the 1980s, the front section of Tripoli's citadel has contained Libya's National Museum. It features numerous wonderful exhibits of the country's history. The earliest relics of cultural life here date back to prehistoric times. Indeed, Egyptian hieroglyphs even mention a tribe called the Libyans. Featured among the many superb exhibits are several sculptures that date back to the period when the country was known as Tripolitania. The statuary of that time was influenced by Hellenistic and Roman models. The former sculptors of Sabrata, Leptis Magna and Oia, the three great antique cities of Tripolitania, created a large number of works of art, many of which remain today. The many magnificent statues from the Roman epoch show that the former metropolis were not only important for trade, but also for culture. Roman emperors such as Augustus and Tiberius were immortalized in stone, their statues having been discovered in the ruins of Leptis Magna. In addition to the monumental works of ancient times, the museum in Tripoli's citadel also contains an impressive collection of small figures. But the Roman epoch represents only a small yet interesting aspect of Libya's history. The museum contains a great deal more. The cultural influence of Islam that is still so important today is highlighted by the Gurgi Mosque that is situated close to the Triumphal Arch. With its splendid interior, it is without doubt one of the most beautiful sacred buildings in Tripoli. The Islamization of the region occurred during the middle of the 7th century, when the Arabs conquered large areas of the former East Roman Byzantine region. They not only introduced a new religion to Tripolitania, but also a new understanding of art. No other part of the city reflects the dramatic history of this region more impressively than the Midan Al Jazeera. On one side of Alga Square is an early Italian basilica, Tripoli's former Heart Christchurch, that was built in 1928. Italian influence grew at the beginning of the 20th century as a consequence of the Italian-Turkish War. In 1934, Libya became an official Italian colony. 
after the Second World War, the country was governed by the United Nations. In 1951, Libya regained its independence. After thousands of years of foreign rule, sovereignty opened a totally new chapter of the country's history. The oldest Muslim building in Tripoli lies in the heart of the old town. The An Nagar Mosque has seen many changes. Over the years, various alterations have not only been made to enlarge the mosque, but also to repair it due to extensive damage caused by the Spanish army in 1510. Its present appearance is mainly due to a 17th century king who appreciated the historic value of the An Nagar Mosque. A splendid feature of the prayer hall is 36 Corinthian capitals that date back to the Tripolitanian city of Oya. In addition to Oya and Leptis Magna, around 70 kilometers south is Sabrata, that is one of the three most important metropolis of Tripolitania. Sabrata is the youngest of the three great cities, although its foundation by the Phoenicians dates back to the 7th century BC. Unfortunately, Sabrata contains no traces of its earliest history. Nothing has survived from the Phoenicians of Tyros. The main part of the ruins dates back to Roman times. Thanks to much restoration work, the theatre is one of the most impressive architectural monuments of this legendary trading city. In the 1920s, Italian archaeologists discovered this building that had been hidden for centuries beneath the desert sand. The theatre has seating for 5,000 spectators. Once spectacular gladiatorial battles took place here that were extremely popular with the Romans. But plays were also popular. Comedies and tragedies were performed and were an important part of Roman entertainment. The origin of Roman theatre culture was strongly influenced by Greek antiquity, the literature of which was highly respected by the Romans. Greek influence is also obvious within the art of Tripolitania and in Sabrata's Roman theatre. Reliefs not only served as decoration, the front section of the stage building also had special symbolic and political significance. The pulpitum of the theatre features numerous reliefs that depict the fraternization of Rome 
with the trading city of Sabrata. The restored facade of the Roman stage building is one of the most beautiful to be seen anywhere. Columns of green-white Cipollino marble with artistic capitals underline the extraordinary architectural charm of Sobrata's ancient theatre. Less famous are the remains of the well-preserved Punic tomb tower that dates back to the 2nd century BC. This building also features an abundance of symbolic decoration such as the fight of Heracles against the Nemaic lion. From the early Phoenician times of the city, no buildings have survived, but this tomb tower features at least one important example of the Punia epoch. The lack of historic remains is hardly surprising. For centuries, there was strong rivalry relating to the rule of the western Mediterranean region by the Romans and the Punia. Carthage, a colony of the Punia, as the Romans once referred to the Phoenicians, eventually became a severe threat to the Roman Empire. Between the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC, both powers fought against each other three times. But one historic battle stands out from the rest. The bloody battle of Cannae in 216 BC brought the Romans their worst defeat ever by the troops of the legendary military leader of the Carthages, Hannibal. The Third Punic War in the middle of the 2nd century BC was revenge for the Battle of Cannae. It ended in Roman triumph. Carthage was destroyed and also Tripolitania, an ally of the Punia, suffered defeat by the former sea and trading power. The city of Sabrata enjoyed an economic and cultural high season after it became part of the Roman province of Africa Nova. Under the rule of the Romans, and particularly during the rule of the emperors, the city's most important buildings were constructed, the ruins of which are still visible today and which attract more and more fascinated sightseers. Roman Emperor Antonius Pius elevated Zabrata to a colonia and its inhabitants were given Roman citizenship. During the Caesarian era, the economic influence of Sabrata grew and grew. Its former wealth is still to be seen in many splendid buildings. The impressive remains of the former Atrium Villa demonstrate the architectural ability and taste of the Romans. Abundantly worked, large floor mosaics demonstrate the former luxurious lifestyle of Sabrata's rich upper classes.
One of the most striking features of the atrium villa is the strongly stylized and well-preserved illustrations of labyrinths that are featured on the floor mosaics. The location of Sobrata, directly on the Mediterranean, was an important strategic advantage for its inhabitants. Export trade was highly lucrative. During its high season in the 2nd century AD, the city also traded from the harbour town of Antica Ostia that belonged to Rome. However, at the end of the 3rd century AD under Emperor Diocletian, the decline of the city began. The Roman Empire was shaken by several political crises whose consequences were also felt in North Africa and Tripolitania. The external power of the empire started to collapse. Hostilities by local camel nomads became more frequent and had a negative effect on Sabrata's economy. The main focus of the hostilities was the region's flourishing agriculture that for centuries had formed the wealth of the metropolis. Although little is known of the ancient history of the city, the Sabarata Museum contains a large number of notable archaeological finds. The museum of this ancient place contains a number of mosaics that are in magnificent condition and date back to Tripolitania's high season. Some of the inscriptions in the former thermal baths, such as the Salvom Levisa mosaic that contains the text, it is advisable to bathe, have survived intact right up to the present day. The various works of art that are exhibited in this museum, and especially the splendid marble sculptures, are typically of Roman influence. Sobrata's magnificent mosaics in the thermal baths have been painstakingly reconstructed by numerous diligent historians and archaeologists. Today, they're among the most important exhibits of the two museums. Throughout the centuries, the splendid temple complexes played a central role in the religious and social lives of the inhabitants of Tripolitania. Antique Sabrata, sanctuaries were also dedicated to various gods. Yet the sacred buildings have a special characteristic. In contrast to the pure Roman cities, in the cities of Tripolitania, Punic and Egyptian deities were also worshipped. In the course of the Christianization of the Roman Empire during the 3rd century AD, the temples lost their importance. Sabrata became the center of a diocese before the city was conquered by the Arabs. Their leader, Okba ben Nafi, chose the former Oya and present Tripoli as his new capital. 
Sabrata fell into oblivion. In the years that followed, the number of inhabitants that was once around 20,000 became less and less. The splendid buildings were abandoned. Sabrata fell into decay. Today, only the picturesque remains of various columns and the impressive Roman theatre serve to remind of the once splendid trading centre of the Romans, Punia and Phoenicians. Who knows what further archaeology may reveal? Alas, despite numerous discoveries, Sabrata has managed to keep most of its secrets. Around 120 kilometers east of Tripoli is Tripolitania's third ancient metropolis, Leptis Magna, a unique excavation site. This also dates back to Phoenician times. There are many discoveries that indicate that Leptis Magna was the first Phoenician trading colony to be founded in the region of the later Tripolitania. Just as with Sabrata, there are almost no archaeological finds from the early days of Leptis Magna. Most of them date back to Roman times. Most of the sculptures are in poor repair. They were destroyed a long time after the city's high season, during hostilities with invading Arabs. Yet the museum features numerous fascinating exhibits. The oldest finds in Leptis Magna were made in a Punic cemetery that had been built on by the Romans. Under the rule of Carthage, Leptis Magna became an important trading metropolis until it fell into the hands of the Numidians. But the rule of the Numidians did not last long. In 111 BC, the city fathers united with Rome against the kingdom of Numidia. Surprisingly, around 50 years later, Leptis Magna changed its allegiance. A fatal decision with serious economic consequences for the once flourishing city. Following the military victory of Caesar in 48 BC, Leptis Magna was punished harshly for its lack of loyalty to the Roman Empire. believed that the tribute claimed by Rome was around a hundred thousand hectolitres of olive oil. However, the city managed to prosper. The violently forced integration of Leptis Magna into the Imperium Romanum brought it a new and even bigger economical high season. The former Leptis now became the Great Leptis. Increasing Romanization brought with it a cultural upsurge that influenced all aspects of life. In following decades, numerous splendid buildings were constructed, such as the huge Roman baths.
many Roman influences, the Punic language and the old administration system were to be found throughout Tripolitania. Unfortunately, the Punic language has only survived in various inscriptions. Its texts were lost due to the destruction of Carthage by the Romans. Only the work of a single Punic author about agriculture was spared from destruction and was later translated by the Romans into Latin. The remains that are still visible today are those of a Roman metropolis with buildings and avenues that date back to the 2nd century AD. Responsible for this flourishing era was Septimius Severus, who was born in Leptis Magna and became emperor of the Roman Empire in 193 AD. Emperor Septimius Severus was faithful to his birthplace and granted generous donations and economic favours to the city. Due to its special exemption from tax, the wealth of the upper classes of Leptis Magna increased and several new and splendid buildings appeared. Leptis Magna was splendid indeed. It was the emperor's birthplace. But Punic tradition and culture survived. Thanks to Septimius Severus, the city became a great metropolis with monumental buildings that were surpassed in splendor and size only by those in Rome. The remains of the 100 by 40 meter Severian Basilica underlines the impressive architectural achievements of this epoch. Probably the most remarkable area of Leptis Magna is the Forum that also originated during the rule of Septimius Severus. The building project was so extensive that it couldn't be completed during the Emperor's lifetime. However, Severus' son and successor, Caracalla, managed to complete its construction in the centre of the city. Septimius Severus also influenced the religious life of the city. Indeed, a temple was dedicated to him, the Gens Septimia. The large forum impresses due to its large number of artistically worked reliefs as well as some Medusa and Gorgon heads. The Medusa had a special meaning in antiquity. The people of that time thought that they fended off evil. However, despite such protection, Leptis Magna, as with Tripolitania's other large cities, was not spared from destruction.
Only a semicircle of ruins marks the city's former market hall. The building was the gift of another generous donor. Annabel to Papius Rufus, a rich citizen of Leptis Magna, lived around 200 years before the rule of Emperor Septimius Severus and had much of his city beautifully adorned. Finest contemporary architects were employed to give the city a perfect appearance. The remains of the former market hall indicate the skill of the architects of ancient times. In addition to the trade of olive oil and other agricultural products, the city also owed its wealth to other more exotic goods. Numerous wild animals such as lions, leopards and elephant from the southern regions of Africa were shipped to Leptis Magna and sold throughout the Roman Empire. The animals were the main attraction in popular, bloody entertainments and were thus highly prized. As with the splendid market hall, the city's impressive theatre was also built thanks to the generosity of the wealthy Annabal to Papias Rufus. In the cities of Tripolitania, theatrical plays were a special social event. As a traditional art form, theatre was in stark contrast to the bloody gladiatorial battles of the Roman arenas. At the end of the 3rd century AD, under the rule of Emperor Diocletian, Leptis Magna became the capital of the newly founded province of Tripolitania. Alas, the city's high season was now a thing of the past, and the slow decline of this once important trading metropolis was about to begin. Although the city was modernized at great expense, the silting up of the harbor could not be avoided. Without its harbor, Leptis Magna lost its economic strength and the military power of Rome also began to weaken. Hostilities by Berber tribes who destroyed the region's agriculture became more frequent. The once flourishing and prosperous lives of those in Leptis Magna became increasingly insecure and threatened. Consequently, most of the wealthy citizens left their magnificent atrium villas and abandoned their fine city. The picturesque residences along the coast were left to their fate. Various mosaics demonstrate the former wealth of the city's upper classes. In addition to invasion by the Berbers and Vandals, the city was also devastated by several earthquakes. Even so, right up until the invasion of the Arabs, Leptis Magna remained inhabited. Until the middle of the 7th century, following the conquest of Tripolitania by the Arabs, the country's center of power was located in Oya, now Tripoli's capital city. Tripolitania. 
The remains of this legendary region of antiquity continue to inspire even today and a proof of a great and golden epoch.